human humane architecture, happening to be the 330th time and somewhere in the 18,000 something views. And we have these three bald guys from the gas station back, who is uh, our producer and host and many other uh, functions. Jay Fidel, hi Jay. I'm <laughs> and you are you are back in Honolulu, Hawaii. And then we have you, Matt Noblet, back uh, actually just back to your Boston. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Good afternoon or evening in your and case, I guess. Exactly. So we, we can also say you're 5 p.m. afternoon, Jay, you're 11 a.m. in the morning, and that gets it to me at 11 p.m. Yes, I'm still awake at the other end of the world from you, Jay, but half around the world from you, Matt, near Munich, Germany. And that makes it exciting because what can we sort of get and learn from these other areas in the world for us back in Hawaii? And, and us back in Hawaii, just to remind the audience, uh, Matt, uh, what is your angle besides um, that we all remember when we moved me over here, that you <laughs> were a guest of ours for, I think, 22 shows. They were called mm -hmm. and are still called because we got a wrap up, which is the Boston Banish Booster. And we also dragged you into some other shows that we see right here next to me, me as the navigator, which were... Uh, reporting on what's going on in Hawaii as contemporary architecture. And you were kind enough to share your opinion as well. But what do we say qualifies you? Because people might say, hey, he's from somewhere. This Howley guy is from somewhere else. And, you know, why would could we care? You have a special angle to Hawaii through family affairs. Share that. I, do, I would to say it qualifies me to opine on anything is probably an overstatement, Martin. But um, no, my uh, my wife is born and raised uh, on the windward side of uh, Oahu, um, and uh, we have spent, gosh, thirty years or so going back and forth between between Kailua and Boston, um, and her family, uh, feather, rather large family, resides there as well. So we've got many deep and long roots uh, into into Hawaii. I'd say enough qualification. And Jay, you um, are, I guess, um, broad-minded enough more than your colleagues at Civil Beat who had been firing uh, Kurt Sandburn saying he's not permanently on the islands anymore. So that disqualifies him from reporting about what's going on in Hawaii. And you will always, and now you just prove to continue to do that. You say it's even better when you guys are somewhere else but you have been in hawaii and you will come back to hawaii um and, and matt you will do as you do every year in in august so we look forward to see us three bald guys at arnold's and having <laughs> some mai tais and being there in real person and real time but until then uh i put these slides together from us a couple days ago matt when you were here back in the munich office and we were hanging out at different places and Let's think about these images here and, and try to sort of distill out of them what we can take home to Hawaii or what we don't take home back to Hawaii for different reasons or what sensitizes more about what we should do in Hawaii. So what comes back to uh, what, what, what do you want to talk about first of all these places where we were? Well, I mean, I would say the beer garden right off the bat as a uh, kind of outdoor communal experience is probably something that um, uh, if they don't exist exactly in that form in in, in Hawaii, certainly the, uh, the kind of strong link to, to the outdoors and the ability to actually be outdoors um, is, a, is a strong binding element uh, between the two places, certainly. Um, I guess similarly, if we went up uh, to uh, the Munich Olympic Stadium where we stopped by um, in the upper, yeah, upper right here, uh, as is another project of um, of the progenitor to our office, uh, which has really a very strong relationship between a, a landscape and a built uh, environment, um, which is also something that has come up in many of our conversations about um hawaii architecture and uh it certainly if not in its actual uh current form is is one of the really big opportunities that the place offers um being such a sort of incredible natural landscape 
I would say totally. I mean, that that we can almost exaggerate and say this project that we see up there behind us is almost better suited for Hawaii than here because you got that weather <laughs> condition outdoorsy and just roofy texture, right? Um, as um, and and here you have it. You know, you have heavy snow loads on there for the winter time, which and you got you got to bundle up. Talking bundling up, maybe that that gets us to um, maybe back to the beer garden here, and uh, basically up here is a heater, right? <laughs> and and that also gets us to you on the right side here with your, which my parents taught me the onion peel layering of second skin, because you came, you were expecting it's already you know kind of pre summer. But we got that sort of chill zone here, so you're you're prepared for everything, right? <laughs> yes, including I guess water uh, as of this uh, this past week, of which there was a tremendous amount in Bavaria. Absolutely, uh, we had that uh, reported on that last time, almost like a century flood in this part of Germany in southern Germany. And we had uh, the, the model you're standing next to has to do with, uh, Jay, you're always into politics a lot and look above and beyond the horizon of Hawaii. You, I'm, I'm very sure you have paid close attention to the European Parliament elections, Jay. What, what's your response to that out of the press? Um, it's moving right, Martin, in case you hadn't noticed. And I'm very concerned that uh, the EU and the 27 countries in the EU are moving right. And that's toward autocracy. So we're going to see soon exactly how far right they moved. Yeah, and it's particularly scary because all of us are involved in, you know, the uh, emerging generation as well. And this is where our hope is. And uh in here in Germany and in fact in Europe, this is the first time when this election was open for minors, which uh, is here not 19 but 18. And so now they they uh, they opened it up to young people uh, as young as the age of 16. And uh, very shocking uh, for me is that uh, you know they were heavily going for the AFD, which is that right-wing party. And um, it's 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 shocking. That's most we can say. And we need now um, a lot of reflection and a lot of attention to these young people and trying to understand where their issues are as we, as we say it. And the, the project um, above me here and next to you, uh, with, by the way, you have Gretchen on your arm, who's my sister's uh, sausage dog. And let's say one word about the the funny, the goofy striped one next to you. Explain who that is. Uh, that was a, yeah, Valdi was a was a uh, graphic character that was developed by Otto Eicher as part of the overall um, what we, what we would call in Germany the Gesamtkunstwerk idea of the of this of the Olympic Stadium project. So this is really the idea that you in, you integrate landscape architecture, building architecture, the graphic program, um, the, the artwork itself, everything has, was really thought of as a single kind of united uh, work of art. And Valdi was the sort of the mascot or the little mascot of, of, these, uh, of those Olympic games. What's interesting about that is that uh, the colors that were used, uh, that were selected by Autoliker as part of that program were deliberately chosen not to have a sort of overt political meaning so this project is a kind of a is a kind of a statement by by germany um hosting the olympic games um in, in a very sort of public fashion um after the war was really an opportunity to demonstrate a kind of a new uh approach to to democracy in a sense and to the way that uh, it governed itself and so um all the elements the kind of the architectural elements these kind of free form tent structures that cover the interior spaces and some of the stadia in there um and this graphic program uh, all were intended to sort of reinforce this notion of a of an open free society and and thanks uh, Matt and even more particularly uh, Jay towards your culture we all remember that there was this terrible massacre in, in 72 against Jewish athletes. 
that ended very, very tragic. And and this was particularly tragic because, as you said, Matt, Germany really tried to prove to the world that it can be better than it had behaved the worst uh, not that long ago before. And more specifically, that's why Otto Eicher was banning red and black and gold from the color code, right? It was very, very sensitively, strategically saying, we're not going back. And also, Jay, um, having been butchered by us as a culture, why was the mascot not a German shepherd? <laughs> because Hitler had one, right? <laughs> so they were very, very sensitive about the symbolism of, of the games and very serious. And so, again, being said now, here and now, uh, that right wing, uh, you know, turn is is scary. It, it couldn't be couldn't be more scary and we had a chance through the project that you're having your hand on there uh we had a chance to get in touch with Ursula von der Leyen very early in her career and having been our minister of defense after and now she's the european commission president who wants to be re-elected and it very much looks like she might be and so it's 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 education for all of us we need to educate each and every one of us, and thanks to you, Jay, that's what this program is doing. And we need to get out to the to the youngest ones and saying, "Hey, um, again, um, there's no, again, you you can't blame them. You know, then they're gonna probably be more oppositional. Anyways, that's what we all did when we were young, right? So we have to really seriously <laughs> sit down and saying, "Hey, we're, we're listening. Where where is your problem? Why are you turning to reactionary? Why are you not want to basically save your planet, for example?" Right? I I did not vote for what I voted in the past for. I once I was for the Green Party for obviously reasons of where we stand as far as architecture met, but they haven't shown to be much better than the other established parties. I went for. A little party, and that's Jay. You know the better system politically because we don't have a two-party system, which from a European point of view is pretty absurd. But we have a you know multitudinal party system, and I went for this climate list. Uh, people who were saying, "Hey, we still believe in what the green people did before they turned reactionary as well and got addicted by power." And that's um, you know that's my personal thing, and so. Yeah, um, all appropriate, actually. Good for you. I think architects are all inclined to be green anyway, right, Matt? Um, and uh, it, it's important that you've done that. The, I'd like to add a couple of things to what you were saying, however, Martin. You know, uh, mm -hmm. it just strikes me that somebody who's 16 years old doesn't really have the life experience to be able to exercise the franchise of voting. <clears throat> and I would be very concerned in any jurisdiction uh, where the government uh, gives that right to somebody who's so young. A lot of them are not even out of high school. The high schools aren't all that good. Um, they're not reading the newspaper. They're not informing themselves. How can we trust them to vote? Especially in times when you know social media will um, give them disinformation and and try to take advantage of their vulnerability and their um, you know their willingness to accept views that that haven't been tested. So I'm, I'm concerned about that. The other um, one other point is that, uh, you know, there's a, a program that just came on Netflix. And if you guys have access to it, you ought to take a look at it. It's very interesting. It's called Hitler and the Nazis. And it's a six part series. It's very well done. And it, ex it examines exactly what he did in order to rise from really being a nobody um, to, to controlling everything in Germany. Um, and having you know people follow him, whatever he asked them to do. And what is shocking about this program is that step by step, it's a parallel to what Donald Trump has been doing. You could you could make notes on the one and find that on the other side of the page, that's exactly what's happening now. And part of it is these young people who are vulnerable, as I said. Uh, who are a, a substantial, un, uneducated young people, I might add, um, who are a substantial part of his base. One other thing before you move on with your monologue, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just want to catch you on one other thing. You mentioned that think tech, as opposed to other media in this city, 
is very interested in international things. That's why we like your show so much. We are delighted to have you visit us from Munich. Um, it's that's lovely, um, and and we like all um, you know foreign hosts and guests to appear, and we we strive for that. So uh, last month I was uh, in Japan, and one thing that made me sensitive to this discussion and you know your your profession is the fact that um, interior design is very different in Japan. And I and I speak of hotels, I speak of restaurants, and it struck me when I came back that YouTube is now filled with um, local, that is Hawaii, uh, local food type restaurants. And, and that's an interesting contradistinction because up till now, um, we had a lot of YouTube um, you know, programs on restaurants in, in Europe, um, in really everywhere, especially including Japan. So now you come back and you see a whole bunch of these new uh, interior, these new local restaurants, and you get a, you get a look at the interior design of the, the ones that are very, very local. And there is no comparison, guys, Matt, Martin, <laughs> there is no comparison between the the kind of um, you know lush um, interior design that you find in Japan in every little hole in a wall restaurant where you could you know you could really enjoy yourself within that space uh, as opposed to these local restaurants here in Hawaii. And <laughs> since we're talking about architecture and how it changes your life and how it moves forward and creates a, an environment in which you can build your civil society. I would say that Hawaii really has to pay attention to interior design. Good point. And interior design, maybe we should then explain where I'm sitting in or in front of here, which is actually where I'm recording from. And, and Matt, you want to share with the audience when we visited my sister in her office home? Okay, this is her uh, upstairs uh, area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I assume. Yeah, so this is a lovely office that she's designed and built, I guess, a little over 10 years ago. Um, that is act that which actually put positions it as one of uh, the kind of progenitors of today's uh, mass timber kind of craze that that our profession is experiencing um, as kind of an alternative to more carbon intensive structural systems. Uh, she was very much ahead of, uh, of the curve there in, in designing and building this, uh, this uh, mass timber massive timber uh, uh, office for herself. Yeah, and per your point, Jay, Japan is a temperate climate. I mean, it has different, you know, subdivisions of it, but it is a temperate climate. So it has wall, it has to have walls as we have to have here. So the office home has to have that. And you have Gretchen on your arm here at the very bottom left again, and the entrance area here and Cynthia talking. There's a very early show back, Jay, for a good laugh. When we first met and the first summer, we had just done a couple of shows and then I went back to Munich. And then you said, hey, you continue. And why don't you do this? And I only had my Lenovo and my Windows Movie Maker uh, talking about us now, re um, and uh, I guess experimenting again. And I did this, but I was so like a one-man band musician that has no talent in any playing any instrument and then uh, I could only do like six or seven minutes and then stop the recording. You see me going to the button there, you know, and then you got mad rightly so because you're a producer and you need to stitch this all together. Right. But regardless kind of the pioneering, uh, I guess, deficiencies of that, uh, the show is called innovation of tradition. It's up there uh, here with Cynthia and she was embarrassed and told you met, she said, whenever people watch that and um, they say, hey, your English isn't really good, but I say it's good enough, Cynthia, you did well. And most importantly, you were talking about this and I was sort of translating and didn't really need to. So it's all good. But I want to point out here at uh, above me, this is your uh, your friend and collaborator, um, Thomas Auer, uh, met, who we had visiting us, as you gave a lecture about more than a year ago, and mm -hmm. he came now. And so we drove by, we shared this in the show, but let's go back to that one, to Interior, 
and uh, and and drove by in our PIing mobile here, our old Mercedes convertible, and and drove by this building here by Howard Hughes. This is the newest affordable wannabe by Howard Hughes. And and Thomas was who is pretty versed in in climate engineering because that's the his company's firm's name, right? But he really had to, uh, you know, I guess get out of the shock to say this could actually be moved in. Climatically speaking, culturally that's debatable, but climatically this is actually ready to be moved in. The raw construction. Nowhere else in back in Boston, back in Munich, back in Japan, Jay and Matt, this is possible. So it's really a unique selling proposition that we have been giving up on uh, tremendously. Um, and I want to switch over to the, the next slide because we often compare automobiles to architecture because there's something to it. And this is the PI mobile as the Soto can join us because he's on a very interesting conference about indigenous communities, the world's largest conference. He told us uh, as his um, excuse and apology, Jay. And uh, he always hosts the PI Mercedes over the summer. And he wants us to put the Moo Moo on the hard top because he says, otherwise the cat's just gonna go in and whatever happens to it, right? So I'm saying when cars can do that, right? When cars can morph, or can dress differently to due to climate. Why can't architecture do that? How about that as food for thought, guys? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is one of those things that we've discussed at length, Martin. Um, no, there really are so very few places on the globe where uh, you actually might you are actually probably more comfortable outside than you are anywhere inside in Honolulu. Uh, and 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 the the things you actually have to do to create conditions of comfort are really almost there are almost are aren't any other than just leave the walls off or make them certainly operable and allow you know allow uh, that climate to sort of permeate the building interior and the number of times that people seem to not quite realize that is a little bit a little bit depressing I think but um, but that's 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 one of the challenges I think as we go forward because the only thing that the only thing that enables that kind of attitude uh, of, you know, heavily air conditioning buildings um, and sealing them up and 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 so forth is um, cheap energy, right? As long as we have relatively abundant and cheap energy, um, it, people, the motivation for people to really work with the climate, I think, is diminished to our detriment globally. Uh, you know, <clears throat> um, I'd like to add something, and it's a, a bit of a problem. Um, because yes, Martin, I think everybody you know who is sensitive to environment will want to have open spaces, spaces open to the outside. And that's one of the you know benefits about living in Hawaii. And some of the best spaces designed, including spaces you've talked about, <clears throat> are open to the outside. But it's getting warmer. <laughs> you know, uh, it's getting warmer, and climate change is going to change all of that. And that is going to affect really everything. And my, my wife was talking to a dealership yesterday, and they said, you've got to be careful about the electronics in your car. Because <clears throat> if the sun beats down on the roof of your car, it's going to fry the electronics. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's just a salesman in a, in a showroom. However, I think he had a point. Um, <clears throat> it's going to get warmer. So the question is, and I don't have an answer. Maybe you guys have an answer is yes, we want to be open to the outside. No, we don't want to spend our energy on air conditioning. But at the same time, it's going to get warmer. It's going to get more uncomfortable. What do we do? How does the architectural profession deal with, with the crosshairs on this chart, the X and Y axis, so to speak? I mean, I think it's a great point, Shay. And I think that we have to, we have to the first thing we have to do is to sort of we have to sort of like move away from our knee jerk reaction, which is to use mechanical cooling to solve the problem. I think part of it is a re is is from a building design perspective, we have to get back to first principles, properly shading uh, interior environments from from direct the, the, the direct sun, working with natural phenomenon uh, or with with you know things like water and plantings to create uh, cooling environments through more 
uh, natural, lower carbon intensive means. Uh, and then we are going to have to fundamentally, I, I personally think, I mean, there's people in our profession who would argue that we'll innovate our way out of this one way or the other. But I have a hard time believing we're not going to also have to recalibrate our expectations about what it means to be comfortable. Um, and, you know, the human species has been a, quite adaptable over many, many centuries. Um, and I think that there will be a, a, a realization at some point that we can't expect to come to be um, consistently in 72 degree environments everywhere, that there's going to have to be a kind of an opening up of the, the comfort band. And all of those things are going to have to kind of come together um, and hopefully be in some ways enough to kind of break, you know, pump the brakes on, on, on this warming, which is what we what our goal ultimately is. Reversal is probably not possible at this point, but we can certainly retard or slow down that process in a way that um, maybe we can deal with it. Thank you. Yeah, that coming that coming from you, Matt, just to let the audience know, I mean, we know each other by now and it sounds like we're preaching to the choir, but just for the audience, uh, Matt, you're you're talking as a representative of the firm that started out very sort of, you know, culturally with Gunther Banish having been, you know, a um a submarine, uh nuclear submarine commander. And having said, you know, if I ever get out of this tin can, I'm going to make sure no one is ever trapped in space. And so he came from a very personal, social, you know, and then the whole, you know, guilt and, and baggage of what Germans have done. So really coming from that angle. And then his son, uh, Stefan, after having not immediately wanted to have been dragged into the family business, but eventually he did. Um, used, uh, you know, his, you know, studies in sociology, psychology to then saying, hey, the signs of the time is the environment and really, I wouldn't say transform, but merge the company, if that's fair to say, keeping that social very much, but adding the solar, if you want to use the two S's. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think it resonates well what you say, you know, going back to the indigenous principles, the Soto being on this indigenous conference and, and also Martin Ansolini, who has been stepping in when we opened up, you know, a year ago, Lahaina happened, the tragic burning down and, you know, met you and the Soto and I, we, we were on a show and try to wrap our arms around it. And then Martin Ansolini has stepped in with some really, really phenomenal and 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 promising and and bringing the hope up high uh, proposition for that one. That, by the way, reminds me a lot of your guys' Sense City, and we talked about that a lot in in studio, which mm -hmm. you did for Las Vegas. Um, and so you know, then and then Thomas comes in, right? If you if you re sort of um, introduce the the original pre-fossil principles, right? And this is going to make the, like say 90%, you're, you're good, you're done. And then Thomas can kick in and squeeze out the last 10% with really clever, cool, literally and figuratively new technology. And, you know, I, I just want to, you don't even know yet, but I, now you know, and you can say no, of course, but our discussion, you know, made me think so much that I want to take advantage of you being, Back in August, when the semester has started, and drag you into studio at least for one time, <laughs> and throw this at the emerging generation that is right now pretty confused, and say what we both said. How about you base on the the you know the place and space making Jay that you're so interested in Hawaii, and bringing it back full circle to when De Soto said no, not that long ago, his half side of ancestry Hawaiian had nothing but feet and not even shoes on. They walked, all they did. And that's not that long ago. So the two of us met said, how about uh, you undo the combustion engine as likely the worst that has ever happened to the Hawaiian Islands? And so that means there's no AC in buildings anymore and there is no fossil car engines anymore. And the easy way would say, oh, then we all go to EVs, which you throw into the discussion, Jay. But we say, let's let's not do individual transportation anymore. Let's only do mass transportation. And, and that is if fair to say, Matt, we're super excited because that changes everything, right? And messes things up probably in a, in a necessary way to really recalibrate your mindset and your paradigms. And 
By the way, Jay, it goes back to, I heard from Ben at McCully Bike that him and you are bicycling pioneers on the island and you got thrown <laughs> off the road left and right into the ditch and you always got back up. And so let's bring it all back. And I'm, if you're up for it, Matt, I'm, I'm excited about it to challenge the, the studio with that, you know, and saying what, what kind of potential does that have? Yeah, it's always Ben Takiesu is one of my favorite people. And uh, he introduced me to Campanolo, which is actually long past uh, the top of the market, but it's a beautiful Italian product. And back in the, uh, I guess it was the 70s, it was the top of the line. Any event, um, as you were speaking, and before you mentioned Ben, uh, it occurred to me that um, one of the ways that you minimize the use of fossil fuel uh, in transportation is you encourage cycling. And uh, in those days, uh, in my crowd, there were a lot of people that did cycling, not only for racing and the like, but for work, uh, mm -hmm. commuting every day. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it was very popular. And it was, uh, it was a lovely, you know, athletic experience, a fresh air experience. And you, you, you didn't have to have a car to do it. Um, it was high tech in its own way with the Campanolo. But let me say that the government since then, Martin and Matt, has not paid attention to cycling in Hawaii. You know, the, the entire physical <coughs> shelf of, of Oahu and the other islands uh, are, are perfect. The, the, I mean, the shelf is perfect uh, to build bike lanes, and yet we, we haven't really done that. We haven't really incentivized it. And, uh, I mean, make me governor and I'll fix it. I'm telling you now. <laughs> um, the, 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 we could use cycling. Now I know that a lot of people can't, you know, they're elderly or, you know, they're not strong enough, but the fact is a lot of people can and should, and the government should incentivize it. And that would change, you know, this, this whole, mm, whole thing you're talking about. It would allow for a new kind, a new paradigm of transportation. Yeah, and that yeah, gets I always, us to I this. Thought it would... mm -hmm. Go Sorry, ahead. Matt. I was just I was just gonna follow up on your point on both of your points. I mean, I've always asked myself how Oahu would have developed had there been a significant investment in in mass transportation, for example, some kind of train, surface train, you know, network that um, you know, that would tend to have tended to concentrate develop de development around transportation nodes rather than sort of crawling all up in all the valleys and up on the hillsides and so forth, um, which are only accessible by car. I think it would have, the, the thought experiment you're referring to uh, would really, would be fascinating to think about how would the island develop, how would you lay out a system like that um, in the most kind of efficient way uh, and perhaps not uh, impact so much of, of the natural landscape as has as, as, as happened. And the current politicians would, of course, say, well, we are doing this. We have been doing this. We have built, been building the heavy rail and there's transit-oriented developments. But sorry, from a European uh, point of view and, and on the East Coast, this is rather laughable because mm -hmm. it's what maybe one could have, should have done some 50 years ago. But, uh, you know, uh, technology and 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 systems and, and and networks have been moving on and just importing an Italian train that once again you get off the airport where you get the most beautiful scent of all these flowers that bloom all the year round and you will only have that for a fraction because then you get you know thrown into this can into this tin can that's 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 air conditioned once again so another really lost opportunity we're not talking about that one and jay when you become the mayor we reconnect you to martin Ant ansolini's collaborator because he was advising the mayor of bogota that is that news up there that i'm now in front of it and that guy makes the connection not back but to architecture and basically says that in the global happiness ranking from gallup the united states have declined uh, from previously the 15th place now to the 23rd. And he says, I wonder if the United States uh, low density suburban structures has to do with it. And we would say certainly yes, because that sprawling thing is just a killer 
on so many levels. And that's why we promised the audience, and now we've been doing a long monologous, multi-monologous introduction to that one, but let's still go to the next slide because we said we gotta build up in the city. And this gets us, we wanna do a, which is always tough for, especially you, Matt, but I appreciate you are not shy of it or afraid of it to look at your peers' work that you're up there together. Uh, seriously, because you're competing in competitions with firms like this one, BIG, that we want to talk about. And, and this project by BIG is, there comes my, but who cares? You figure out, make up your own mind, which of BIG's projects. BIG is Bar Bjarke Ingels Group. That's the founding principal, and that's his firm. And this is my favorite of his projects. It's some few years old. Um, but I think we can learn a lot from that because it's a lot about public space, Jay. And we talked about this here in preparation for the show. So you know a little bit about it. And Matt, I'm very sure you know about it as well. So mm -hmm. I'd like to pick your guys' brain uh, about this project and what we, can we learn from it literally and, and what sort of figuratively. And if you want me to, it's, it's is this power plant that is pretty central in Copenhagen. It's actually so close that the, the 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 Danish queen actually has it in her view corridor. So can you imagine uh, that being a very attractive kind of a, a background? And and Big did a did a pretty clever thing in basically uh, saying we give it a, a a civic function besides of its very banal. But it's important from its typological point, too, because it's doing the, and now, uh, go figure, 2025, that's next year, right? They want to have made the transition from fossil, from coal to biomass. So this plan plays a very important role in that, sort of technically. But um, be, they said that couldn't be it. It needs to also be there for the people. So they basically said, well, we have climate speaking, we have cold weather, but we have flat land. So all we have for fun is cross country skiing, but downhill skiing is way more fun. So <laughs> let's make this a ski slope. So they multi-purpose that. And then there's a summer condition that we see in there. So there's hiking and climbing and all these things. So I, I always thought this is a, this is a pretty fantastic uh, project by BIG and our youngest generations is, of course, through the you know through the publications we talked about last time and the media. They're drawn to the star architects, to the big firms, and and like them. And one of our most promising talents, Chris Jugueta, who we see there up at the very uh, top left, where I'm moving myself up to now uh, on that side here, the guy in the middle, and Siraj. They were once in Copenhagen because we had an exchange that we need to reactivate and they wanted to come over and check out Martin's stuff that I talk about here and there and say if that's really, you know, the way I talked about. So they wanted to check me out. And they were, uh, when they went to Copenhagen and came back, they said that changed our life. Having been in a, in a city, Jay, where H1 in Copenhagen is a bicycle highway. <laughs> uh, the bicycles can always go first and the cars are seriously discriminated. You feel so bad if you're around in a car. Here, it's the opposite, right? In Hawaii, as you're saying, the politicians haven't been paying attention to that. You feel bad on a bicycle. I, My students often say, was it you who we saw up on University Avenue, which a name is program, why right? it leads to campus, where there is no bike lane? And yes, I'm suicidal doing that. But, you know, we have to do it because we can't just let the cars uh, pretty much win. So this company, BIG, um, has been coming out with this monograph. We talked about our monograph and, you got, Matt, you have a couple of them. So this one there, Hot to Cold, is the monograph. And let's go to the next slide. Because and this is ironic, because so many years ago, sorry, Jay, we're airing this only now and not like uh, nine years ago, because in 2015, over the summers, as now, I went back and this time to Berlin. There's this traditional bookstore called the Bücherbogen, because it's at the uh, below mass transportation, an elevated train, by the way, that we're now getting. This is historic. This is from back in the turn of the century, not this just recent century, but the one before, right? And they got this bookstore. So they got books out there. 
Uh, there's one you said, you know, we've been part of the uh, solid timber pioneering on the top right. We see that school for disabled children with that ET of E roof that we've both been experimenting with parallel timing wise. You at the Unilever headquarters and the Marco Polo Tower, which is, by the way, urban uh, residential high rise. And it also had Dean Sakamoto's Hawaiian modernism uh, uh, b a book on there on the shelf. That's pretty cool, right? That's a good <laughs> ambassadorship. And and relating back to last week's shows, uh, last week's show, Jay, what what Jay, Dean Sakamoto put on the title of the page is an Osipov house that has long been torn down. It's the Blanche House, and it's actually more than the Liljestrand House that we all know. Uh, the ultimate of what you describe, Matt, as and Jay, as the outdoorsy living house. That used to be, guess where in Kahala, where we talked about, which is the most Floridian, uh, uh, you know, troubled uh, 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 tropics part of us in Hawaii, where there's big money that seems to be stupid. So people tore this down. It was from 1959 and never replaced it with anything. Go figure. So these were the books that were out there. But the other book, Hot to Cold or Cold to Hot, also featured the project at the very bottom. Does that look familiar? Yes. This is, guess what, Jay and Matt? This is Kaka'ako. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's at an early stage where the, the project in the, in the center here that now I'm putting myself in front of uh, or above me is uh, uh, Mr. Me Too in architecture, Richard Meyer. I mean, has turned out to be, unfortunately, Mr. Me Too, Richard Meyer, uh, which that project has been pulled. Um, and um, is now where that um, turning around in her grave, um, um, Victoria Ward, the Ward's, um, what's it called? Um, Victoria Place or something like that by Howard Hughes is built. And the project that BIG had proposed is what in, what's in front of that. And it does not look too unappealing, right? Um, uh, but I give you a little hint of maybe a potential, you know, problem. That is, uh, I found this on this uh, render company, uh, illustration company's web website, Visual House, and they hadn't been taking it off. And it was subtitled, Howard Uses Big Pineapple Balcony Terrace. So um, <laughs> at least we have outdoor spaces. We have, you know, we have terraces. We have greenery. Isn't that something, Jay and Matt, that we're so tragically missing in Kaka'ako as it turned out to have been built ever since 2015? Well, Kaka'ako was supposed to be the exemplar. Um, you talk about renderings uh, back in the day when they're trying to sell these condos at first, you know, for mm, millions and millions. Um, you, know, you saw all these renderings of tree-lined streets and little tables on the streets and uh, sort of a, you know, a, a French motif with Cinzano everywhere. Cinzano <laughs> umbrellas. That's how you do it. Um, but, you know, that never came to pass. And the there are 50-foot escarpments and, uh, you know, setbacks that are like 10 feet, maybe, maybe less. And so the result is it's not a walking city. Uh, Kaka'aka is not a walking city. Um, and query, is there any place in Honolulu, in Oahu, which is a walking city? You have these nice, mm, these nice designs within the condo amenities, but not on the street. And a quality of life for public spaces, you have to walk out the front door of the big building. Okay, I'll agree, you have to have tall buildings. That's just the way things have to go. But then when you walk out the door, there really should be you know, uh, setbacks, real setbacks, and real Cinzano, and a place you could order coffee. And, uh, you know, and, you know, like all those cities in Europe, I could name, you know, 50 of them, where you walk out the door, it's a beautiful, beautiful experience. We don't have that. When I, when I was first offered a job in the military to come out to Hawaii, I said, what is it about Honolulu that's special? And the guy who didn't know left from right, he said, Honolulu is a walking city. And that was instrumental in my decision to come to Honolulu. But it wasn't a walking city. It could have been a walking city, and it is not a walking city. So we've talked today about architecture from the outside, from the inside, interior design. We've talked about you know the interplay with climate change. 
We should also, we talked about bikes and transportation. We should also talk about walking city because that also takes governmental incentive. And I would say, Matt, you, you guys are really experts in that because again, tracing back to Gunther's social motivation. And um, if you guys rewatch, which is also from that urban transcendence, it was produced a little better. So the quality isn't quite as bad. Um, I mean, technically speaking, that is the one when I went to Hamburg and interviewed a, a, a peer from, from my college days. Um, and she was instrumental in um, the um, heydays of the Harbor City. And we called the show mm. uh, Germany's Kakaako, Hamburg's Harbor, Hamburg's Harbor City. And you got to rewatch this show to get the whole discussion and the complexity. But just again, your Unilever building, I mean, this is a multinational headquarter. It's it's very sort of exclusive by its nature. And as Martin Haas, your you know, former business partner, uh, who was the project architect, once told me when he had me visit and showed it to me under construction when he had the first single layer ATFE uh, sort of mocked up there. Um, mm -hmm. He basically said, we insisted, as they did in the Hanover Bank in my hometown, to make, uh, Jay, the, the ground floor and more than semi-public, actually real public. you got to have you know, the public go through a private institution of a bank you got to have the public basically plow through and flaneur through a, a corporate headquarters. How cool is that as architects basically pushing that? And you guys do that. I'm very, very impressed and proud of you guys that you do that. You don't take the easy way out. Oh, we got a fancy project. We got to make it all cool. It's all going to be exclusive. This is it. You talk each and every client um, into and remind them of their obligation to serve uh, the public, the people on the ground floor, at least. Maybe mm -hmm. you can expand on that a little more, on Matt. Yeah, I mean, as we as we look at this project, which is, I I totally agree with you. It's it's really quite interesting. This kind of you know, particularly this terraced environment at the base of the tower that has all these amenities uh, and outdoor opportunities. The question I would have about it is simply, um, you know, is this? Uh, well, let me put it that way. I, the, the, I would be much. I would personally be interested in how does one democratize those qualities in buildings, um, even if, and I rather doubt this is the case, but if these um, condominiums and apartments in the tower are naturally ventilated and they have, you know, good access to daylight and to to the uh, the Hawaiian climate, um, I I personally like to think that we as architects have a responsibility to open those opportunities up to the largest uh, population of people possible. And so whatever they do in Kaka'ako, um, the bigger question for me is should, how, how do we build from, for a larger, for, for more people uh, within a similar way and, and demonstrate that it's, it's not just people who can shell out $50 million for penthouse apartments, um, but people who have to pay, you know, a thousand, two thousand, whatever dollars uh, a month in rent, shouldn't they have access to those same those same fundamental kind of uh, qualities? Yeah, and I think your your social the your solar criticism is already shown down there by the rendering people, pretty honestly, because you see that sun, that western sun, as we know from uh, orientation, because the ocean is to the left. Um, Mackay is to the left, and that low sun is shooting straight into the units. So, but um, again, and not to call you guys hypocrite, because we just recalled that the Marco Polo Tower, which is the residential tower in Hamburg next to the Unilever, uh, used to be once the most expensive dwelling, you know, in mm -hmm. Europe, in all Europe, if not the world. And, and that is something that was just, you know, couldn't be discussed because you had a client who wanted it this way. But again, the ground floor of everything, of the whole, you know, block, uh, you guys fought for having been accessible for, for all the people. And that is certainly, or, you know, to be um, assumed, not, not the case here. And another point I want to make when you flip through, and the, the monograph, we don't want to just, you know, you know, we're not bitching anyways. Hopefully, Bjarke can take this as constructive criticism. And he's been doing this monograph with this Austrian graphic designer. 
and I try to get the point across that they're a climate sensitive firm that blue stands for cold temper climates and, and hot stands for more tropical and that they sort of um, are sensitive for that. But when you then flip through the book, um, at the bottom, you see uh, little thumbnails of projects they have from all over the world. And you get the you get the sort of feeling that maybe it is not so sort of customized to Hawaii, but also appears as some sort of you know pattern, not to say style, some elsewhere. And it's certainly when you have a high volume of projects, you know, to work on, I guess you know it's it's unfair to to say that that is not challenging. At the top, these are the pages I took the pictures of of these projects uh, that they had. So I'm, I'm at some point I'm, I'm interested to ask, and I will have an opportunity to ask um, uh, one of the partners in 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 BIG and um, and to ask him why these projects were actually falling through and and never came, uh, because after the fact, and this is the last rendering we got from that website here. We're now looking, we're seeing Diamond Hat there in the very distance here um, above me here. And we see this sort of second uh, Howard Hughes, the Anaha, which almost wondered me about the name picking, sounds like anal and intestines, and it kind of looks like that <laughs> in a not very charming way. And uh, so to the right, to the right, you have that uh, Mr. Me Too that never happened here. And in the in the middle, and this is shocking to me because Jay, we uh, this building here is the YA uh, by um, by uh, the local firm um, W. Um, no, I'm blanking even on the names WCIT, and uh, and its principal. Uh, once I attended a presentation, and he said, "This is inspired by my people. He's Hawaiian." And by the huki lao, which is communal fishing, and it's this is this curvy facade. And I thought, like, hey, your ancestors would slap you for you know making that connection because there there, there was communal fishing. You threw the the pre pregnant female fish back into the water. They practice sustainability. Make that postmodern you know comparison to a glass wall. That's the antithesis of that. I I found really, but now I have to say. And that's as bad as it is. When I now see Kaka'aka almost completed, we have have to have one of the next shows, Jay, about wrapping up because Howard Hughes was now uh, saying we are sort of get rushed and we now need to pop out the last four projects and we have this produced and it's ready to be aired. And uh, sorry again, there won't be good news. It's it just continues or concludes the same bad way it 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 it, it went on all the time. But this YAA now, we're looking at it actually from this uh, EVA side here, actually has more lanais than most of the projects after that. So I think it, I almost, I hate to do, but I almost have to rehabilitate that project that I thought was such a bad start. And again, um, then there's Genie's project and how us guys and not want to be machos and sexist, right? If there's a female in all this discrimination of gender, if there's one female architect, we got to give her a special attention, but hopefully also Jeannie Gang with the um, uh, with a tower she did that she used sugarcane as the analogy. Again, we would say Jeannie and basically Bjarke, um, you're certainly the most ambitious towers of all the very unambitious by Solomon Cortwell Bunes, but next times you got to do better. You got to do, you got to learn from you guys, Matt, uh, with Tommers. And, and not looking at some um, analogy in a postmodern literal way, but go figuratively and saying, how can a building actually perform like a sugar cane? How can a building perform like an eye, uh, like a pineapple? And that way it might actually not look like one because nature is nature and architecture is architecture. But I allow myself that all of your projects uh, met actually look more like pineapples from its performance. <laughs> and they don't look like, but they function like pineapples and like sugar canes and like trees and other other vegetations, because they're the closest to that in 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 being decarbon in their functioning, and that's what nature has been doing. And uh, wrapping this up here, I mean, uh, the theory of relativity that Einstein came up with. This is the one that Ram. Uh, you know, learned on. Uh, sorry, that that Bjarke came out of. This is Ram Kolas's office. 
And 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 this is a project that's going to replace uh, my favorite um, hole in the wall um, Korean Dochang restaurant on that block J and Matt uh, just uh, on P Koi Street, one block over from Kapilani Boulevard, uh, which is to the left here. This is this Asipov building here next to it, and it's going to replace it. And and doesn't it look like things we have seen before? like the Lilia by Solomon Cockrell Buens in Waikiki, um, which is, again, a glass box that has this sort of unshaded front towards the ocean and then has these not deep enough, um, uh, you can call them lanais because they're not deep enough. Here, this more looks like the symphony uh, that is right at the Blaisdale. Uh, that is not far away from that one. That is basically also like a microwave and it's just baking, you know, getting things hot. <laughs> so it's, it's really, um, and this is, this is also could be another Boston Danish booster show volume 2023 20, that it really says we need you guys and we need to, you bet. And we uh, need to find a way to talk to our colleagues as I just said, I will do because I'm invited uh, to a jury by a classmate of mine from my prairie days in Nebraska, Keelan Kaiser. Thanks, Keelan, who has the dean of Austin, the architecture school in Austin, Heather, uh, Keelan, and then it has Douglas, who's a partner within BIG. And I will, again, be inconvenient and pull him aside, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> at some point when we meet. And I basically say, OK, what was the reason you guys got pulled? And when you would come back, what would you do differently? You know, mm -hmm. and you hopefully do. And in the announcement, Jay, and then we've got to wrap up. This is the last slide. Um, and you've been already saying we have been proposing things like that. Uh, this is the last studio review. We see our dear DeSoto sitting there at the right and looking, and we have Martin Ansolini there. And it is basically the uh, the provocative proposition to say we unmumu, we undress. And, and then I think, you know, Jay, your point is well taken. I, I think I actually need to transfer over to the sociology department. And Matt, we talked about that. Because architecturally, that's pretty much... Uh, less than not even rocket science. It's it's very simple to do. And this is, in <laughs> fact, the reapplying your guys' um, 72 Olympics with attained security systems. And you can apply this to Kaka'ako, to downtown, to Waikiki. Uh, but you got to talk to the sociologist. And you once said, Jay, when we first introduced sort of a little baby version of it, Primitiva, uh, three, you basically said, oh, do I have to be naked in these? And I, you remember <laughs> what I said, Jay? I said, no, it's it's not exclusive. So just because I will be naked in there, you don't have to. It is inclusive. So you can choose how you want to be in there, right? And that's basically the point. And the pineapple I'm, I'm holding there uh, right above me is actually a real pineapple from where we did the uh, 70th uh, anniversary birthday shows in the Breakers because it turned 70 the same week that the Soto there turned 70. Mm -hmm. And it's a pineapple that was grown in a planter trough in the, in, the, in, in the Breakers Hotel. And Ethel runs it, who has been running it since it opened in 1954. And she continues to grow these baby pineapples in the in the planter. So a, a guest can pick a real pineapple and eat it for breakfast as a Hawaiian toast, which is that weird thing that a German, uh, mm. you know, <laughs> a TV cook came up with somewhere in mid-century that that gives uh, you know the Soto a kick, and that's one of the reasons why he calls us kooky Germans. But um, I, I, I want to invite you again, Matt, um, steal a little bit away from your precious vacation time and drag you into <laughs> the School of Architecture and, uh, and help me to provoke uh, the, the emerging generation that is so much in trouble and is so confused and, and that Gladly. they can go to, to, to vote for right-wing parties, right? That we uh, confront them with these issues and saying, hey, you be in charge of your future uh, and not in a depressed way. You don't have to do that and, and wait for someone to lead you 
And I, I told you, Jay, I think, and you met too, there's a point I'm waiting for. It's only a question of when and not if, when I tell my dear colleagues and my faculty, uh, when they are crying for a, a leader, I said, I don't, because if I tra Google translate what leader means in German, you understand why I can't do this, because it's Führer. So, you know, young people, don't wait for someone to lead you. Lead yourself and, you know, accept guidance from us who mean well, but you got to and take your future into your hands and uh, and use Hawaii as a, the reason why I came, Jay, to Hawaii, you said why you came through the military. The reason is why I came because I thought it was paradise. Of course, that's what everyone thinks. But also on top of what everyone thinks, I thought of it disciplinary ways because I had been building as we have been doing, Matt, when we want to achieve you know, lead platinum or passive house or whatever, right? In temperate climate, we got to do a lot. It's mm -hmm. very, very um, heavy. It's it's a lot. It's going to be expensive only because we have to make up for shivering temperatures. And by the way, we have sometimes more heat here in the summer in Germany uh, in the hundreds. doesn't last, mm -hmm. you know, forever or long, but we have it. So we have to design to that, which in Hawaii, we basically don't have to. And that's why I came to Hawaii, Jay, to say this is architectural paradise because you don't need to do all this effort. You can actually have a beam transfer all the way through from the inside to the outside without a major disaster. You know, in Boston, no way, Matt, right? You can never <laughs> no. do that. The cold no. is going to creep through. You got to have condensation. You got to have mold. You got to have misery, but not in Hawaii. So I think the point is we're trying to make is really dwell or a return as you correctly said matt because we had this mid-century we're all lovers of mid-century we're members of dokomomo in one way or the other let's reconnect to these virtues and then of course use all the marvels from our modern times as you guys do you're very high tech you're very into innovative systems together with thomas so it's a blend of of both right the proven old and the the goodies from the from the you know future to you know tap into already now so well you Absolutely. know what else you have for the summer in hawaii <laughs> <laughs> i'm looking forward to it and and jay now that you happen to have some more times in your hands um then already look for excuses not be dragged into that as well or you just give in or give up and and join us on these discussions and <laughs> and let's you know kick butts of the of the emerging generation in a in a in a friendly way. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Martin. It's been a great discussion, Matt. It's been great to engage with you and to have you on the show. Martin, Likewise, thank you. We covered so much ground, so I say <laughs> both of you thanks and aloha.